Hi everyone, welcome to the Meno Lounge. I'm Julie Gordon-White, CEO of Meno Well, menopause energy and protein bars. You know it's Tuesday, because here we are speaking to a wonderful expert on all things menopause related to plants. I'm so excited, plant-based nutrition. So we're gonna have Dr. Amanda Tracy. I see you here, I'm gonna pull you up. We're gonna jump right in. Um, I don't have any anything in my teeth, right? I just whipped down a mineral bar right before I got on. Ooh. Worked out this morning, hit the whole meeting thing, and you know, I, I always just want to say you need to have a mineral bar with you. This sounds like a commercial, but it's just the truth because you don't want to get caught with no nutrition and no food, and then you need to have a bar, a mineral bar that's plant-based, vegan right doctor yeah hello dr tracy i'm so glad we're finally here we're actually you know i could throw not a rock but like a really big baseball maybe or football and <laughs> hit you i'm going to be driving uh, your way i'm going to davis this weekend to spend the weekend with my family my parents i'll be driving by right where you live yeah oh yes i know i'm right down the road it's such a beautiful time of year here too gorgeous before it gets too hot and yep. before my allergies are on fire. That's the other thing. <laughs> oh, yes. I've already been on fire for a couple of weeks, but I'm taking my supplements, so I'm, I've calmed it down. It just oh. catches me by surprise every year. It, it happens. <laughs> you know, growing up in Davis, that's the hay fever capital of the world, practically, at least felt like that to me. So the Bay Area is better for me, but we can talk about that. I think that'd be kind of interesting to throw in, especially I think allergies and things like that do kind of change in midlife, our bodies change. And so we're in the spring. So that could be a fun thing. But I'm mm -hmm. so excited to have you, you know, Meno is a plant based bar, it's vegan. I really when doing my research, um, got on that idea that when we eat more plants, and I, I do eat meat, I need to say that. So I'm not sure you can tell us if you eat meat or not. But um, but a more plant-based diet that our bodies feel better, they're calmer, we're not working so hard to digest food. So I'm super excited about our conversation. And can we just jump in and tell us, you're a naturopathic doctor mm -hmm. for over 15 years, you're a member of the um, of NAMS, National North American Society of Menopause, I know that. So you are all in the peri and the menopause and the post conversation related to plants, yes? Yes, I've had a practice in Massachusetts for 16 years, and three years ago, I moved to California, right down the street from you, and during that time, I transitioned my practice online to focus solely helping women in perimenopause and menopause, which before that switch had been about half of my practice, so now I'm focusing solely on all that. It's funny how we get closer to these things, like all of a sudden it's like, it's my everything. It was our nothing a few <laughs> years ago. Now it's our everything. So, right. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So let's talk. Why did you decide to make that shift besides moving? What was the call to you? I need to speak and support women in this stage from Perry to Post around plant based eating. Can uh, you particularly because I had always had some hormone imbalances in my teens and 20s that I was unaware of besides not having regular periods. That was my sign. Mm -hmm. My periods would come and go and no one can find a reason for it. And um, that also propelled me on my plant-based journey. So through naturopathic school, I was trying different therapies, herbs, acupuncture, lots of different things. But what I really found was making the switch from vegetarian, which I had been since my teens, to full, fully plant-based in my late 20s, early 30s. It was what really made the shift in my hormones. So I got really interested in it after seeing, experiencing it myself. And then through, as my practice was growing, I really noticed that a lot of women were coming to me in the ages of 42 to 47 for uh, hormonal imbalance symptoms, stress management, sleep changes, mood changes, feeling tired, all of these sort of nebulous systemic okay. symptoms that grow and grow over years. And then they would come into my office because their periods were starting to get weird or they thought it was menopause or their doctor told them it was menopause. And sometimes, often, we would do testing and find out that it was other things in their lifestyle and nutritional deficiencies and stress hormone imbalances or thyroid hormone imbalances that were causing symptoms that looked like on the outside perimenopause. 
trouble sleeping, uh, hot it's, flashes. It's usually periods. the other way around so, where it I, is peri or in menopause, but they think it's something else. Right. So that's interesting. It's, so I was seeing the opposite happen as my yeah. practice was growing. And I really loved working with these women because when you're an integrative practitioner and practicing natural medicine, when you really get to help the whole person and their whole lifestyle and their um, body, mind, and spirit, which is how we're approaching perimenopause, it's really rewarding. And so when I had the opportunity to really think about my practice, if I were to start all over again at year 16, what would I do? And I thought I would retain what I love and really focus on that. And so it's been liberating to really define this niche and help these women even further and be able to focus on it and, and get deeper into the research. I love that. Now that we have more research. Now I was going to say there's there about a 20 the year gap are, there. <laughs> there. There's bits and pieces and it's really just gathering all these things up and to, to try to create these trends. Okay. So just share with us, are you a vegetarian? Are you vegan? Are you a flexitarian? How do you eat now? What's your, what's how your eat now and how I've eaten for the past, I'll say 18 years is vegan. Is vegan. Uh, okay. However, I have patients that are omnivores. I have patients that are vegetarian. I have patients that are vegan curious, like trying to figure out how to do yeah. it, which is what I help patients with a lot getting enough protein and enough fiber and basically enough food and which takes a lot of preparation and, and mental preparation, not just physical meal planning and prep, but to really know meet that you're meeting your needs, but mm -hmm. if not everyone has to be vegan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I practice plant-based medicine. I do use herbs and vitamins and um, hormones, and some of those hormones are plant-derived and some of them aren't. Mm -hmm. So it's always a conversation that I'm open to having to get what the individual patient needs. I love it. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about specific fruits and vegetables to eat to help balance our, our hormones, and blood sugar, all those good things. But can we go straight to the question that everybody asks? We are so protein obsessed right now i'm all i'm very fiber and protein like the combination mm -hmm. um but i would just want you to talk about protein because that is always the first thing someone says well if you're vegetarian or vegan how can you get enough protein without eating a ton of let's say pea protein powder so or maybe right. that is we do answer. want to eat real okay. foods we don't want to just have protein shakes all day so the first thing to realize is that most Americans are eating 150 to 200 percent of the protein that they need. So if we're comparing a plant-based diet to what an Amer a standard American diet is, we're not going to be able to do that using plants because it's just too much food. And most Americans should not be eating that much protein. So we are protein obsessed and over consuming the protein. So what do you think is too much? Let's qualify. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, it does depend on your, your size and your weight. So we're going for uh, a gram of protein per kilogram of weight, mm -hmm. usually. And that's still on the higher side. If you look at nutrition journals, they recommend 0.8 grams per kilogram of weight, which let's say for someone my size, who's at 125 to 130 pounds, is look, that 0.8 brings me around 55 grams, but I'm really shooting for 65 to 70 grams being in perimenopause and trying to be that with definitely that is considered protein heavy okay. so um it's manageable it's so interesting you it know is. because you know as as i get to talk to lots of different people different lenses it's you know one gram of protein per ideal body weight that's kind of the king 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 and so your lens is that that's actually a lot of protein more than what we need is that what you're thinking Right. That's what you okay. It's more than I love what it. we this need. This so good. We need all these perspectives because I want women just like menopause, the experience of perimenopause and menopause, we are all different. So it's important that we hear all of these perspectives and you find the one that fits best for you. Right. So. so we're going moderately high protein and moderately high fiber, as you said. Okay. So um, that's how many the goal grams 40, is moderately high 40, 40 grams 40 grams a day so that's actually high right yes it is because high yes that is high you know, because then you know i've heard 25 is like shoot for 25 because it's so we don't need enough fiber at all so yeah. i guess the, so more the average again like looking at it towards the average american is getting around 12 yeah. so 
at 30 is what's recommended for most adults most people women coming into my practice that are like health conscious and eating well like having salads and vegetables for another meal usually have around 25 to 28 when we look at it we're trying to bump it up to 40 because uh, fiber helps to bind extra estrogen in our gut. So for perimenopausal women, when their progesterone levels are starting to decline over a few years leading up to menopause, estrogen isn't changing yet. And sometimes it is spiking even more than it had been in their 30s. So getting to that 40 grams of fiber is really important to help balance the estrogen dominance. Interesting, okay. Oh, there's so much here. I love it. You know, our bars are high fiber, mm -hmm. 25 to 32 percent of your daily fiber. Uh, and some people are like, oh, that's too much. You know, my stomach doesn't like it. I want to eat half a bar, work into it. It's just because we're not used to eating that much fiber in general. Right. And then if you're if you're folk, if a patient is focusing on solely the fiber, but not looking at the other parts of their diet, as far as protein and calories total, and they're adding in the fiber, yes, it may be cause more of a problem too, because they're adding it on top of other things that they're eating and not incorporating it into the balance. And our guts do get accustomed to fiber. The more that we add it in slowly, our gut bacteria adjust to it. They start doing wonderful things with it and making great hormones and serotonin and melatonin and it just takes a while to get used to that feeling of the fiber as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good, good. Okay. We went right in there. I love it. Okay. Well, I know we'll come back to it again, but let's talk about specific fruits and vegetables that you believe we should be eating every day during our perimenopause to postmenopausal journey. So one of the most unusual categories I talked to my patients about that they didn't realize before were the fruits and vegetables that are high in beta carotene, which is the plant form of vitamin A that makes things bright orange, like carrots, like carrots. sweet potatoes, uh, peaches, mangoes, yams, pumpkin, squashes. So those are really important uh, mm -hmm. because the beta carotene helps our liver make a little progesterone from other hormones, mm -hmm. which is good in perimenopause. Mm -hmm. It also helps progesterone from the ovaries. So in perimenopause, if we're having erratic cycles or PMS that all of a sudden is two weeks instead of two days now, or more severe, really helping to amplify progesterone helps. And the beta carotene vegetables and fruits help to do that. There have actually been studies showing that beta carotene concentrates in the corpus luteum of the ovaries and helps ovulation improve. So it's mostly talked about in the fertility aspect and preparing for IVF and fertility treatments, uh, but it still works for perimenopause. Uh, so it's worth what? doing. I have no idea. I just thought you eat a lot of carrots for your eyesight. Right. Well, it's, it's surprising. People think, oh, that's all it's for, carrots. <laughs> I made a carrot tea for our eyesight and they thinking um, no other uses, yeah. but Beta carotene is also really uh, healing and soothing to the lining of our colon. So as you, if you are trying to increase fiber in your diet, making some dietary changes, or if you're, for some women have more constipation during PMS or around their cycles, the beta carotene can be really helpful in alleviating that too. Hmm. Okay. So orange fruits and vegetables, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's our, our clinical nutritionist, Barb Sobel. She Hi. is obsessed with carrots. Do you know Barb? You know? Uh, we just talked yesterday. Oh, yes. Yeah. We just met yesterday online. Yeah. Small, small world. Okay. Um, I'm sure she actually not that small. She made that matchup happen, but um, she's obsessed with carrots. She said, <laughs> I've eaten so many carrots. I'm almost orange, like literally yeah. because she's. I'm partial to butternut squash and pumpkin. I get really get excited and fall when those things come oh, in season. Pumpkin. Pumpkin. Why do we wait until the fall to eat pumpkin? It's so good. I love pumpkin. Pumpkin seeds also. Every mm -hmm. day. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Beta carotene. Excellent. Really, really good. Okay. What else should we be eating every day? So all things orange. Fruits and vegetables. All things orange. I'll say two servings of greens because we definitely need those. Um, when we're thinking of greens, uh, I usually tell my patients to think about the cruciferous vegetables because those help modify estrogen levels before and after menopause. But go beyond broccoli. I know it's the most I'm famous one. Obsessed and, with broccoli, and I love it. I think broccoli tastes sweet when it's steamed just right. And I know people might think I'm crazy, but it definitely has some sweetness to it. I mean, go beyond broccoli. Think about kale. But I also see a lot of patients that, again 
have some digestive troubles and and those high sulfur vegetables like brussels sprouts and broccoli and cauliflower are a little bit to handle at first so there's lots of leafy green cruciferous vegetables like arugula uh, kale mustard greens like those also have the beneficial compounds like broccoli but aren't as difficult to break down and digest and it's pretty easy to get organic pre-washed arugula and throw it in your bowl or salad every day so that one's a pretty easy one to adopt that's a good one and I get a pre-washed uh, bag of uh, kale and shaved Brussels sprouts. That's my mm -hmm. favorite. Does that count? Oh, that definitely counts. And that's another way to get to shaving the kale and the Brussels sprouts and adding them in a little bit at a time instead of getting, the, you know, kind of a, a whole cup of roasted Brussels sprouts and trying to break it down when you're not used to eating that way. It's Which not the I, way to start. I love Brussels sprouts. I mean, I, I love mm -hmm. vegetables. My body tolerates fiber very well because I've been giving it a lot of fiber but i think it's really important to find foods that we love because a lot of times when you talk about eating more plants and fruits yeah we can find fruits usually because they're sweet we, we are you know kind of oriented towards yeah. sweet things but vegetables like oh, i don't like vegetables but i think everybody can find vegetables that they love that is an orange or green i know we're probably going to talk about some more um veggies here too and, and a way to prepare it, right? So could right, be it's, it's thinking about how people like have issues with the texture of vegetables. We try to do more raw or shredded. If they like things that are more sweet, we definitely go towards the broccoli and carrots and and things like that. Um, or roasted beets are another really good one to incorporate. I was for hoping you were going to say beets. Okay, <laughs> literally yesterday I had that kale brussel. I took a picture of it. I almost posted it, and I think why no one wants to see the salad I ate yesterday. But um, kale with the shaved Brussels sprouts, beets. So roasted red beets all over the time. It was like a pink and green salad, but also with feta, which probably is not. You're not a fan of that, but the feta, the goat cheese was. Mm perfect on there well so. when i'm talking to right well i do that too i create these beautiful salads and i'm just like in awe of all the colors i'm like i have to take a picture and show people but this right. is my salad but when dairy when i do counsel my patients to reduce dairy or some of them need to, need to avoid it totally but thinking of dairy as a condiment or like a sprinkling yeah. of feta on top versus the base of the dish right. so that's the way to use Fair it enough. <laughs> it's like how I went from pasta being the base to the broccoli being the base with a little bit of pasta, not the other way around. That right. I'm definitely not um, in a favor of food restrictions and, and cutting foods out that you enjoy um, and, and looking more to add foods in and add nutrients in and add in health and not look at food as the restrictive. That's thing. good. I do think yeah. in midlife, we want to add things that we love and not always, we're so used to just taking everything out and restrictive and diet this or that but mm -hmm. adding things that are good for us you know but but we have to do a little work on that it, because sometimes if we're not used to eating things that are nutrient dense and that's what all the things you're talking about are um you see eating more packaged foods or you know what's convenient you have to do a little homework but we're worth it we're worth investing the time to figure out what orange things and you know what vegetable green things and and we're yes. gonna, i want to talk more about beets because okay. i think okay. they're yeah. magical right um but so it takes time but it's so worth it when you figure these things out okay so beets yeah. talk to me about beets uh, because i love beets i love beets too so one of the things when we're thinking about perimenopause and menopause hormone balancing isn't just about how much how many hormones you're making and how much of them you're making. It's about how they're balanced and processed in the body. And the liver has a lot to do with that in balancing estrogen before and after menopause and also detoxifying testosterone and progesterone. So we want to help the liver do its job. And beets are one of the things that do that. And they help with general liver detoxification. So other signs of needing liver help are skin changes like acne and rashes, but also immune system changes like seasonal allergies getting worse or appearing when they never appeared before for you. Those are signs that your liver needs a little bit of help. And so that's a reason to add beets in. I say every day for my patients, but really when I say every day, the goal is gonna end up being like two to three times a week. Cause that's, you know, if it's on your mind consistently, you'll get them in your salad two or three times a week, which is great. Daily, daily. <laughs> Good <I job>. <laughs> Okay, question though. I like, um, I don't like my fingers and my kitchen being mm -hmm. red, right? Cooking, yes. I have baked beets many times, but I don't like it. I prefer the yellow ones, the golden ones that mm -hmm. I can hardly ever find. 
but I buy the ones that are already in the sealed in the package that are already made. Um, and then there's canned beets. I don't know. What do you think about can? I mean, I'm I'm bullish on frozen foods, but what do you think about canned beets specifically? I don't recommend mend the canned ones i most of my patients when they start out they do get the pre-packaged cooked ones that you get in the um sort of like the deli section near the uh, fruits and vegetables those are usually easy to find most grocery stores have them uh the canned ones i mean there's the aluminum in the cans the lining of the cans there's the added sodium they do have a different texture so sometimes that patients don't like that either so if if they can find a way to get the um you know pre-packaged ones that are pre-washed or they do sell beets frozen as well they'll be chopped mm. um some whole foods and in our area nuggets so some of the higher end grocery stores have them um so that's oh. possible and those I'm are like i wouldn't use the frozen ones on salad i'll say that for you because you're usually having them in salad that's what i would put in a soup or something else that's already going to be kind of um softer texture because the freezing them does change the texture a little bit yeah and texture matters especially when we're oh, talking yeah. about vegetables right? exactly <laughs> everything but especially when you're trying to find the things up okay there i just asked that because um the beets that i normally get they were out of so i i got a can of of a can of beets and i thought and i taste them they don't taste as good there's nothing like a fresher mm -hmm. uh vegetable but i really wanted those beets so that's how committed i was to the beets just so oh, you know. that's i'm gonna eat the great. can there's, there's no extra salt but yeah the you know the stuff from the can eh but I was desperate, so, okay. <laughs> Not when it's all about me. It'll be fine, right. <laughs> okay, and I love you're talking about liver and liver, keeping our liver detox, detox. That's, you know, I always get a little e mm -hmm. on the detox mm -hmm. word because it's it's triggering and not always, you know, we just use that as a way to get people to do things. But let's talk about the liver and the importance of taking care of our liver, a healthy liver in midlife. We hear now a lot about fatty liver, even if you don't consume a lot of alcohol. So can we talk about that and how that relates to perimenopause and beyond? Yes. So you're the normal metabolic process that your liver does for everything that you consume, everything you eat, everything you breathe in, everything you put on your skin, that is called detoxification. I know the media has taken the word and mean it attached it to aggressive protocols and quick fixes, but metabolically, like that's the process in science. It's a detoxification process. So that's what I'm saying, detox for the liver. I mean, help it do its normal everyday job. So it's important to balance estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So then your liver takes hormones and changes them into a way that they can be eliminated in the body if we need them to be mm -hmm. through urine or through your stool, which is why we need a lot of fiber there. So beets are really helpful for this greens and beta carotene foods that we've already talked are helpful for this artichokes are especially helpful for this and uh that's one that usually people aren't eating pretty often when i talk to them about their difficult to prepare them, and their short i always want to dip them in something yes. you know like oil olive oil or i grew up eat, dipping it in mayonnaise, mayonnaise which i think mayonnaise is yucky now but, right so um, we don't want to go in that direction necessarily covering it in fat I, but in artichokes that. really help bile production and as we enter menopause our bile which helps us dissolve fats in our body and in our digestion gets thicker and that's why a lot of women do have gallstones or gallbladder issues as they're transitioning into menopause because changes in estrogen change our bile so having artichokes pretty regularly really helps that with beets as well. So frozen artichokes are fine. Um, you can also get them jarred in oil. So that's another way that they're already marinated and you can kind of pop them on your salad. Yeah. So that's usually what patients do. Now there's so. the hack now. Yes. I'm gonna do that, okay. <laughs> and artichoke hearts or the leaves or the whole thing? Oh, artichoke hearts. hearts. So you okay. get a little bit of the leaf and the heart. So that's, um, you don't have to get the gigantic artichoke fresh in the produce section and try to deal with that. No. I don't even do that. So I like it, but again, I can't I expect anyone else to do something. that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna add that to my beautiful salad every day. Yeah. So, so thank if you. your liver is healthy, it's going to be balancing your hormones in a, in a functional way. But you had mentioned fatty liver and the growing incidences of that. Um, our liver cells are always regenerating. It's one. It makes it a little bit different as far as the rest of our organs, like our skin and our liver and our gut lining are always regenerating and recreating themselves, which can be good and can be bad. Yeah. So 
if we have a, a diet that's too high in sugar or refined carbohydrates, it does affect the liver the same way that alcohol does. So that's why we're seeing more cases of fatty liver with not necessarily alcohol abuse. So having higher sugars in your diet affects the liver cells so that then when they're turning over, they don't turn over in a healthy way and they turn to fatty liver cells instead of functional liver cells. So one bad part of that is it's more fat in the liver, mm -hmm. but the other part is they're not functional. So they're not detoxing the way that regular liver cells do. Mm. So that can start to create some hormone imbalances in estrogen and progesterone, but also with cortisol, uh, stress hormone and insulin and glucagon and blood sugar balance. So if it starts to create its own problem with sugar balance, even though it's from too much sugar, so it makes it even worse. Wow. So eat your plants. Eat your plants. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because the good news is fatty liver cells can reverse. So they can change to back to normal functioning, healthy liver cells, the more that your carbohydrates and sugars are controlled and the more fiber and protein in your diet. Well, let's talk about fruit then, because mm -hmm. there's, you know, fruit is a way, especially when you are cutting out processed foods to have a sweet thing. Um, I love blueberries. That's another one of my obsessions is blueberries. And so let's talk about fruits. What fruits should we be eating? We talk, you know, different colors here, more on the veggie side that can be more of our sweets and will help us during uh, the transition. Right. So we definitely still want to have fruit and the fructose is less absorbed than other sugars, but also fruit is a great source of fiber. So I always recommending my patients to have two to three fruits a day. And number one would be the berries. And I include pomegranate in that category, even though it's not a berry, but some of the properties of pomegranate and the flavanols that are in it make it similar to a blackberry, a blueberry, um, elderberry or strawberry and um, how it affects our body. So a serving of pomegranate, pomegranate juice, berries. Um, I prefer blackberries and blueberries. Um, blackberries are the highest fiber berry <laughs> and they're purple. We don't have too many other purple foods in our diet. Um, of the other berries, when they're in season, I mean, we're starting to get into strawberry season here. I mean, definitely have those every day when they're in season. Um, but blackberries and blueberries, pomegranate for sure. And then focusing on other high fiber fruits like apples and pears. Yeah. Usually those are the easiest year round. People can get um, pretty good apples and pears. They're really high in fiber, um, low in sugar. That's the other right. piece of it. Too. Pears, oh, with any, the, any fruit that's in season is, I just think it's telling us you know, nature's yeah. way of saying, hey, eat me now, eat me now. It's when we eat fruits and vegetables out of season and we're trying to make them something that they don't want to be right now. We're just not getting the benefit. Right. They're, they're, you, you can just see they don't have the vibrant color that they have in season and they don't have the taste. And so they don't have as many vitamins and, and flavanols and antioxidants in them. So definitely eat the mangoes when they're in season in January and eat the plums and apricots in the summer and enjoy those. But always be getting the berries and, and the high fiber fruits in too. Get those in. Okay. Mary asked about cranberry juice. I, I have banned all juice in my house. I am the juice like... And my, my family, I don't have everybody in the house anymore, but even my husband loves juice. And I'm like, just eat the thing. Don't drink the thing, eat the thing. So what do you think about that? In general, I am obviously in favor of the whole fruit versus the juice. When we start talking about pomegranate, sometimes the juice is easier. And I'll have my patients do a two or three ounce serving and use that juice as their berry for the day, um, particularly on days if they don't have time to get the other berries into their diet and use that like to take their supplements. Yeah. So they're using, uh, not having it as a snack, they're using it as water a little bit, a just little, a couple ounces. Okay. <laughs> a shot of cranberry juice, yeah. Right, so be mindful of the sugar. Yeah. Um, and always it's good to rotate the berries. They all have similar, similar properties, but slightly different for our blood vessels, for our heart, for our brain. Uh, in our hormones. So rotating, you know, blueberry, blackberry, strawberries, raspberries, and then rotating the pomegranate, um, juice, cranberry juice. And I saw someone asked about tart cherry, cherry juice that goes into the equation too. So those count as part of the rotation. 
Um, and particularly for urinary tract, it's good to rotate the berries too, because if you're always doing cranberry to prevent an infection, the bacteria get smarter. And then you start to create a superbug situation in, in the urinary tract. And then, oh, great. then the cranberry okay. stops working. Here comes so. that cranberry again. Yes. <laughs> Got to trick it. So your thoughts on the diversity. So biodiversity in our gut health. Um, of eating different things so we don't just get used to it? Or do you think it's better to eat the same kinds of fruits and vegetables most of the time so our gut is used to that? What do you think? I think it's better to rotate and have more variety, again, for slightly different micronutrients, slightly different antioxidants. When we're looking at long-term health, like Alzheimer's, cancer, and heart disease prevention, that variety really helps. Your gut is going to be happy with more consistent levels of fiber, consistent protein, consistently low sugar. So more that you're changing the micronutrients, that's fine. And following seasonality, again, to get the bang for your buck uh, nutritionally and for your dollar, like that type of rotation, but being more consistent with the calories and the macronutrients would help. Yeah, I love that. So consistent with calories and macros, which is our protein, carbs, and fats, and then diverse and rotating with our fruits and vegetables based on what's in season and available and right. I know it takes more effort. I mean, we hear something like, oh, blueberries are great for the brain. And we want to just have the cup of blueberries every day in our breakfast and be like, check, doing that. Like, but really the more that you can rotate and take advantage of the seasonality will benefit your body. This is where we give the shout out to the farmer's market, right? Because yes. that's where all the good stuff <laughs> is and you're supporting your local person. I, you know, I get lazy about the farmer's market because then you got to like do something with all the stuff when you, when you get home, but it's worth it though. Super worth it. Yeah. Um, okay. I know you have some tips for us about how to eat, how to eat a plant-based, uh, lifestyle be in a plant-based lifestyle in midlife so we can eat better and feel better that's what we're all about men well eating better feeling better eat whole foods and if you can't eat whole foods have a bar so you don't make a different choice that's what we're all right. about so give us some tips uh i'm excited about this go ahead sure i mean my five tips that really kind of take you through the day so for all women looking for hormone balancing and plant-based nutrition I like to start out with a, a cup of warm lemon water. So squeezing a quarter or a sixth of a lemon into some warm water, that helps to get your digestion going for the day and to get your liver going. So we already talked about how important the liver is in managing hormones, but we haven't talked too much about digestive function. And for all humans, once we start getting into our 40s, we start creating less stomach acid and less enzymes. So our digestive system slows down. We mostly notice it as feeling like bloated or heartburn or sluggish. But really, if you can start that process with some warm lemon and water in the morning, you'll be less bloated from the rest of the day and for your and through your meals so you can have more fiber. So not my coffee first thing. Not the coffee first thing, but the second tip is enjoy your coffee <laughs> by 10 a.m. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we're not cutting out coffee, okay. but as, as a lot of women know, uh, as you're enter perimenopause, your sleep gets a little bit lighter. Uh, we're lighter sleepers. We can wake up more easily. It can be more difficult to get sound sleep. And then there's also hot flashes around menopause. So coffee can be a trigger for those. Coffee also can um, lighten our sleep. So if we have the coffee by 10 a.m., it has enough time to process in our body throughout the day and not disrupt our sleep. So. Okay, I push it to 12 because if I go past 12, I'm in trouble, but I can go like right up to the edge. So you can see like right here, I'm yes. this much. That's a great <laughs> idea. You're you're modifying it to know what, you know, what your level is. Right. Which just changes. Um, let's yeah. see. Um, Let's see, uh, maybe Robin, E. Robin says, uh, does it have to be fresh lemon juice? No, it does not have to be. I mean, you can get the organic, I get this, um, was it Santa Cruz brand organic bottled lemon juice? And that's fine. I wouldn't get the, um, like the green plastic, like lemon that's from concentrate. So try not to just get fresh juice that's already bottled. That's fine. Least, doesn't they make that either? I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, it's right next to the organic one in the store. I don't know who, who would choose yeah, the green, plastic, orange, or the yeah, version. Worth, but... worth, 
<laughs> Robin, you're worth better than that. Yeah. Go steal one from a neighbor and leave a little note. <laughs> Thanks for the lemon. Okay, moving on. All right, Tom. <laughs> yes, I I haven't been enjoying. We have a lemon tree in my yard in California, so in this time of year, I'm still using our own lemons. But so. There. Lemon water, um, coffee by 10 or by noon, if you know that that works okay for you. And then have lunch be your largest meal of the day. And also, you want to make sure you're having protein. If you have grains, this would be when you have grains. And if you have raw vegetables, this would be when you have raw vegetables. It doesn't have to all be raw, but because of those changes in our digestive tract, as we're aging and our digestive system slowing down, and with hormone changes, um, we can tend to be more bloated, eat more easily. So you want to have the more difficult things that are to break down, like grains and raw vegetables, earlier in the day. Because that's when you're more active and you can burn them off a little bit. You're simulating your digestion to break them down. Um, for protein, we're aiming for, for most people, 20 to 25 grams of protein, which... Per meal? Per meal. Okay. But when we get to the later tips, we kind of like split them up later in the day. Um, so... For lunch, you're looking for 20 to 25 grams of protein, um, which can be a, a cup of lentils or a cup of black beans in your salad. Black or a half beans are magical. Yes. yes. Black yes. beans. Yeah. And, or a half cup of lentils with nuts and seeds and some quinoa and a salad or some roasted vegetables. It, it sounds like a lot of protein, but when you start looking at how much is in a cup of lentils, it's more than a serving of chicken. Yes. The thing is, most people are having four servings of chicken when they have chicken. It's They're over-consuming. <laughs> anyway. So. Oh, I love the controversy of this because, you know, we're also advocates of lifting weights and not and lifting heavier than what, mm -hmm. what we think we can lift. So there's that whole protein thing and keeping our muscle synthesis happening. So get that protein in. Yeah. Yes, so we definitely want to make sure we're having the protein. And so that large meal for lunch, which is a good meal, that will have your raw vegetables, some cooked vegetables, your protein, your greens, if you have grains. And then as you start going into the afternoon, um, a lot of people do have like a maybe an energy slump around three or five. So this is what I recommend having a half of your, your dinner protein, like having a protein shake or having a bar mid late afternoon because um, that helps to prevent the cravings before dinner like when we get home over hungry we know we need to cook dinner but then we're grabbing chips and we're grabbing mowing down every chocolate thing. or anything that's or the half the ingredients we're using while we're cooking all those things so having a snack around 4 p.m should help prevent that especially if it does have a good 10 to 15 grams of protein it doesn't have to be a shake or a bar if you work from home or you can prepare like hummus and vegetables or some nuts and seeds or other things like that, that's fine. But you do want to make sure you're having protein as that snack that's more stabilizing. Excellent. Yes, keeps you full. Yes, yes. and keeps you full and prevents the, the grabbing things when you get home later. Um, if you have alcohol, you want to have it before seven. So um, I'm always telling, always telling my patients to day drink if they're going to be drinking. <laughs> Midlife, I, there's a great meme around, you know, like all these women day drinking, and it's like one o'clock or something. And like, you know, it's not that we don't have fun. We just have fun earlier. That's the thing. Right. So, right. so I'm not saying you don't have to drink every day or anything like that. But if you're going to have a glass of wine or two, which would be the most, to have it before 7 p.m. So, you know, late afternoon by 7 p.m. Again, to promote restful sleep at night yeah. because alcohol does disrupt our sleep and so for most women if they're going to bed around 10 or 11 if they're curbing the alcohol by 7 it um, doesn't interfere with sleep as much um, or at all and it doesn't also um, cause them to wake up in the middle of the night to urinate more so if you're going to do that <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have some wine, have it before uh, seven, before dinner, ideally with a protein snack and not just alone. Um, so having some protein with the alcohol would help um, your metabolism too. Good. Yeah, alcohol is barely our friend anymore in midlife. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not a friend. But anyway, okay, moving on. All right, yes. what's next? Definitely. And then the, the last tip is for dinner to be somewhat smaller, um, smaller than your lunch lunch and because you've had your protein snack it can have about 15 grams of protein it can have more if you want more but to have the quantity of your dinner be smaller and to have your cooked vegetables then not the raw vegetables 
Um, a lot of women like to have a salad for dinner and their family's eating other things and they find that easier. But because our digestion is slower in our 40s and 50s, the salad can often cause a lot of bloating and gas and um, too much digestive distress while we're trying to sleep. And again, we're really trying to set up the whole day to get some sleep at night because um, right. we really need it. <laughs> I love that. And any little thing that disrupts it is bad. Uh, this is I had really hadn't thought about it this way. This is fantastic. So have all those raw vegetables where your body's working really hard to digest them in a good way, good way at lunchtime. Yeah. And then by the time, and then you're having that snack at three o'clock with more protein in it. And then you don't have to pile on so much protein at dinner. Um, and then you've got to cook vegetables. So the digestion is easier. Is that what right. you're saying? Right. So dinner would be cooked vegetables. I usually don't have grains. So like protein and cooked vegetables or like a soup that contains both would be great. So that's something easy that patients can do and cook ahead and have, because usually it comes up that they're eating differently than the rest of their family. So if you have something prepared like a soup, <laughs> and so then you could have that uh, and then your family can eat yeah. something else. Yeah. Oh, okay. I sh I'm not judging. I used to do the same thing, but I have no people now that I worry about. Either you eat what I'm eating or you eat your own thing. That's what happens when you get in your 50s. Like, oh, well, if you're hungry, you'll figure it out. That's, that's where I'm at. <laughs> yes, which is a wonderful strategy, too. And I'm working with a lot of women in their uh, first half of their 40s, and they have little ones that aren't even ready, are ready to be able to cook for themselves yeah. yet or prepare for themselves. So I remember they're in a tricky days. spot. No judgment. <laughs> I raised three people, you know, so my husband and I are like, ah, trying to figure out that food thing. Glad to be over that. So really, really good. Um, do you have another minute really quickly to talk about sleep? Because that's sure. one thing that's so important. And then I want to have you come back on and we're going to talk completely about supplements, natural supplements. It's a whole big topic. And I love your take on that as a naturopathic doctor. So we're not going to talk about supplements today, but I just want you to just talk about sleep. How about sure. that as we wrap this sure. up? So uh, I do see a lot of patients for, where sleep is their primary issue. And that there's so many things that go into sleep when we're entering perimenopause. Progesterone makes us be lighter sleepers. So waking up in the middle of the night is often an issue. However, if we're waking up in the middle of the night and staying awake for a while, it's usually not strictly perimenopause hormones causing it it's something else mm -hmm. so if you're not falling back to sleep after you're waking up then we look at blood sugar because sometimes it's low blood sugar in the middle of the night um, it also can be stress hormones which we find out a lot cortisol is up at night so we work on stress management during the day if you're waking up between 3 and 5 a.m it's a sign that your liver needs more help. So go back to the beets and artichokes. Ooh, <laughs> so sometimes you can get clues about when you're waking so, up. And then if you're waking up. All the above. Everything. <laughs> yeah. So often we have all the above <laughs> happening at once. Um, and we work generally on creating a good sleep pattern. So a lot of it is the five tips during the day to make sure your digestive process isn't disrupting sleep or caffeine or alcohol isn't disrupting it. Then we look at the two hours before you want to fall asleep and creating a great good sleep hygiene with whatever makes sense to you and your lifestyle. Sometimes it's a cup of herbal tea and reading or crafting or stretching. Um, we try to avoid heavy lifting and intense exercise in those couple hours. So really trying to help the system balance and calm down. Yeah. Yes. Calm down. Okay, yes. you, we didn't talk about breakfast. Are you an intermittent fasting <laughs> advocate? Is that why you didn't say anything about eating early or did we just skip that um we i kind of just skipped it more because people are either not eating anything or they have their set protein shake in the morning well i say fine for my patients they have their set protein shake in the morning and they, they're not changing anything around breakfast um because they've got to really get their thing um i am a fan of intermittent fasting i work with patients on figuring that out for them too and seeing if it's going to work for their their lifestyle as well some patients actually do better if we are eating they are doing the early morning starting with the protein shake but we're not really eating after five uh, 4 p.m like they are on an earlier schedule because i work with a lot of women i have women that have like sort of altered schedules a lot of nurses with night shifts mm -hmm. and things that we're working around so um, intermittent fasting doesn't work for everyone but um, it is a really good strategy and it can work for women it helps i
I find, you know, when you're trying to manage your energy intake, aka calories, yes, uh, makes it easier. I, I love a 12 12, so giving my body 12 hours after I try to finish eating by seven and then don't eat anything, but I'm hungry in the morning because of that 12 hours, I really want something. So I do eat earlier probably than most people eat. Um, but 12 hours works for me. So I guess you, you do have to find right. You do have to works. find what works for you. I mean, people ask me the question, they've read the books or the, the blog posts and they're like, oh, okay, I have to do 16 hours. And I have to start with that and then work on from there. And then they're trying to figure it out. But usually we are using the strategy as a way to figure out how to use the calories and the macronutrients in an efficient way, in a way that works for you. And for me, I do a 14, 12. Mm -hmm. So um, okay. I yeah. don't wake up hungry in the morning. <laughs> And I don't, but I do like to work out before lunch. So I do exactly. need to balance that. Exactly. Got to fuel that workout. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, so good. So many things. Okay. Um, I need to ask you one question and that is what does me uh, menowing well, what does meno well mean to you? Uh, oh, to me, it means having excitement and hope for the future and seeing it as a positive transition and a liberation. I love it. Yes, yes, yes. yes. What she said, fantastic. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay, so here's Lisa Pepper. Where do you two get the extra two hours? Oh, and 14, 12. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Come on, it's magic. It's menopause math, Lisa. That's what that yeah. is, right? Yes. Yeah. 10 hours of eating, 14 hours not. <laughs> I love that. Some people are so clever. She caught that right away. I just moved right on from that. Okay, where do we find all things Dr. Amanda? I know you have a boot camp coming up. You have a special guide. Tell uh, everyone here and those watching the recording where they can find it. Sure, they can go to dramandatracy.com and get my recipe guide, which has hormone balancing recipes. And I'm also doing a Bootcamp Playbook Workshop on April 10th. They can go to dramandatracy.com slash playbook and find information about that. All right. And follow you right here on Instagram oh, as well. Yes. All the information is on Instagram. Good stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know it's, it You're was welcome. time in the making, but so glad it worked out. We have to meet IRL, you know, have a exactly. lunch on the way and then um, come back and talk about supplements because supplements are a thing. I think they they have a place for sure, and um, figuring out the best way to utilize them in midlife. How's that? Would you Absolutely, do that? I love that because it's a very important topic. Yes, it is. Okay, to be continued. Thank you so much for being mm -hmm. here, and I'll see you IRL soon, and everyone else. All right. Thanks for having see you me. Next time. Oh, we'll see you tomorrow on the Meta Lounge special episode with Dr. Sharon Malone about her new book, Grown Woman Talk. So, see you tomorrow afternoon. Be well. Bye.